I will start sharing my screen. That working for people just loading just got a couple minutes yeah we can see that okay great however i think the person who's delivering with you maybe just left oh no she's coming back here we go Is, is Georgia back? Yeah, she's back. back. Okay, cool. Okay, well, we will we'll get started. Um, so th thanks everyone for joining us uh, this week, the third one in our instalment. Two two good ones I feel so far. So we want to hopefully keep keep the positive momentum going. Uh, so we've got what a uh, webinar this week titled "Developing the Complete Squash Player." So hopefully that intrigued you all to uh, to come along. Uh, I'm not sure what your expectations are for it, but hopefully we meet them. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the kind of the process that myself and Georgia went through um, to get us to the point that we're at right now, um, mostly based around what how we went about the approach that we took to developing her as a squash player, not necessarily the the hows and whys. Um, I'll go into any great detail because obviously we're, we're, we're worried about people coming in and stealing all our ideas and learning how to beat Georgia. Um, not that that would ever happen, huh, Georgia? Oh. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to take you through the process that we went through to try and uh, to try and help Georgia as much as possible and just explain a bit of the rationale and uh, and allow you guys to ask any questions. You can ask any questions as we go through. Um, Alan will keep an eye on those questions and maybe just stop us as we go. Um, if there's anything interesting to, to, to talk about at that point, uh, maybe Georgia, do you just want to maybe give a little introduction so people can see you on the screen and um, and just tell us where you're at with your squash and, and when how, how we went about getting started? Yeah, uh, so I'm Georgia. I am 19 years old. I'm just out of juniors. Um, and I am currently 92 in the world. Um, Paul's been coaching me for about three years now, I think. Um, and yeah, started first year of coaching. I was also coached by Kevin Moran. Um, and then the last couple of years since I've, um, maybe it's three years now, actually, that we've been working together. Uh, no, two years, just the two of us. Um, and that's been while well, I've been at college and uni. Um, so yeah, is that all right? That's enough. Yeah. Where were you when you started with her when we first started working together? Where was I? Yeah, rankings wise and, and no idea. Um, I was probably yeah. I don't actually know. I definitely wasn't anywhere near where I am right now. Uh, I just started on the tour. Um, now I'm trying to play a bit more on the tour. Yeah, cool. So it's been. Uh, I think this was a good, a good opportunity to showcase what we've done because it hopefully will be relatable to a lot of lot of people. It's not. It's not necessarily starting off working with a professional player, but it's working with an ambitious junior who really wants to do something, and this is the way that we kind of did things. Uh, so to to kick things off, I wanted to pose a question. Uh, start off with a question. And that question is, what is the first thing that you do when you start working with a new player? Um, that, that's a question that I want you all to answer, if you can. So if you just answer it in the chat function, uh, as many of you as you can, just answer that simple question. What's the first thing that you that you would usually do when someone approaches you to uh, to start working with them as a as a coach? Alan, if you maybe want to shout out some of the answers as they come in. Oh, 
Are we getting anything, Alan? Sorry, I didn't realise I was on mute. Um, do you just recap quickly what you're you're asking for? There's a few that have literally just joined when you were going over that. Yeah, uh, so. we're just uh, as a starting point. One one simple question that we wanted to put out there was, what is the first thing that you would do with a new player when you start coaching them? So things that are coming in there's a, a bit around like asking their goals or what they want to achieve um, to aid like developing a relationship there. Yeah. Um, somebody puts out just like watch them play a match with somebody. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, goals is coming back up again, um, and understand maybe whether they're looking to just like play better or if they've got a target to move up rankings and um, to beat a certain person or get fitter. And um, I guess it links links with goals. Um, yeah, a, a lot similar. Asking what people want to achieve. Um, yeah okay that's cool uh the reason why i asked this question is that i have a real bee in my bonnet with this sort of stuff and that is kind of when coaches just um get asked by a player um to give them a lesson and they're just like yeah jump on court with them and they start off back right let's play a few back at, let's play a few forehand drives and see what it looks like and then that is just a recipe for going down a technical model straight away uh, there's no problems to be solved all you're doing is looking at the player aesthetically and seeing what you might want to change and i see this happening more over and over again with with coaches out there that work with players and it's just getting you off on the wrong foot so a lot of those answers that came in were great um I, one of my key things is getting to know them. So I want to get to know the person that I'm going to be working with as a person. And I want to get to know them as a squash player as well. Um, it's going to be pretty difficult to learn a lot about them as a person uh, right from the very beginning. But if you have a goal to get to know them as a person, then that will, that will come through and start to have some conversations around that just to get a feel for who they are and what they're all about. Um, but certainly trying to get to know them as a squash player will really help. Like I said, as a coach, you want to be trying to solve problems. Uh, so to me, you really want to get to know a player by getting to know them at their worst. Uh, and to me, that usually comes out in competitive play. Uh, what you see in a one-to-one -one coaching session in a group session could be completely different to what you see than when they're really up against it in a pressure situation. So I always want to see the person in competition before I start coaching them, just to see what they're all about, see what really makes a difference to them. And like this, so it's so easy nowadays to do it with kind of YouTube. If you're working with all the streaming things you can do it that way you can just sit and watch them play a match or if you're really clutching at straws then you can um, have a game with them at the beginning of one of your coaching sessions just to really try and uh, and see what what happens to them when they're in those situations and what what areas they're strong what areas they're weak and and really get to grips with what what needs to be improved what would you say um was your weakest area when we first started Georgia if, when I was watching you in a match what was the key thing that stood out uh, I think mentally um I was a bit of a rage um get very annoyed at all little things and another thing is I'm just all over the place um if you saw me play a few years ago um I think you know what I mean like diving all over the place and um just all a bit chaotic not very much control going on in any aspect yeah, mental is definitely a good word to uh, to describe Georgia when I first started working with her. Um, but that's uh, with because of that, that really impacted in the approach that, that I took to um, to help her and to help her to get to where she's got to now. Um, but without that, if I just walked on court without much background, we would have probably gone down a very different route. Um, had it not been for the fact that I'd seen her play in a number of different situations and, and understood a bit more about who she was as a player. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. The next one, the next slide is an interesting one that I put in uh, just for fun, really. You can tell I've got a bit too much time on my hands at the moment. But 
I wanted to try and give a bit of an illustration as to how difficult it is to be a coach and what, what's going on in the complexity of being a coach. So let's have two minutes to see if anyone can interpret this picture. Do you want to ch chuck it into the chat if you have any idea what I'm trying to get at through this image in this slide? Alan, you can shout out any good answers. Yeah, yeah. Alan, can you hear me? It's Jim. Yes. Uh, for some reason, it's not letting me go in the chat. Cool. Um, just just check them out, Jim, um, over the microphone for now. Um, the idea is. Obviously, going to put the players under a microscope and get the fine detail. Yeah, certainly one aspect of it. So, what I was looking for with this picture is to try and demonstrate how difficult of a job a coach has. So, someone comes in with, I guess, something along that lines, Paul, um, about um, searching for like the little details of where a, where a player can improve. Um, you have to take an in-depth view um, and also think about the bigger picture. Yeah. Zooming in and analysing their game in depth, I guess it links to it as well. Taking the long view. Yeah, some great answers there. Kind of uh, just, just to kind of give you my train of thought on this one. Um, as well as having lots of fun putting it together. Um, it was kind of what I wanted to demonstrate with it was squash as a sport is, is the background of this image and just it's so complex. There's so many different things going on and uh, there's so many different aspects of it that you could look into. Um, so it's a really complex sport. And for me as the coach, what I need to be able to do with this complex background is both be able to zoom in using the magnifying glass on certain aspects that we're really going to dive deep into the detail and and look closely at to try and make improvements and make assessments of where they're at while also looking at the longer term stuff using the binoculars so i've got to be able to do both things all at the same time so i've got to be able to plot the long term and understand what the long term is going to be as well as going into the detail of the specific things that we want to be working at in the short term while and also trying to avoid getting distracted by everything else that's going on. Uh, so it's a really difficult job being a coach and you've got to be really uh, strict with yourself to, to do it successfully. Um, so that was my bit of fun last night trying to, trying to pull that together. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to uh, to get in to know a squash player and the kind of the process that you would go through to uh, to help you to do that and to help you to get to know the, the player that you're going to be working with. So I've just come up with a few questions that are really important for me when I want to start working with a new player when I'm trying to do as much as I possibly can uh, to help the player. Uh, so I want to know how do they play? I can ask and these are questions that I can either ask them for answers with I can just find out for myself and answer the question myself or collaboratively come in there but the best way to do it would be collaboratively come up with the answers to them so I have an idea the player has an idea and we come together to merge them so that we're both on the same page with this uh, so how do they play why do they like squash that's a really really important one uh, what do they want to achieve from it, which obviously a lot of people have already come up with, with when they're talking about goals. How do you want to go about doing it? What are the players' strengths and weaknesses? And then how do they win matches? Which is talking about how do they use their strengths and then why do they lose matches? Um, and that can really open up a lot the conversation into a lot of different areas, which when we're talking about the complete squash player, uh, that's what we want to know. Like I said, not getting too zoned in really quickly onto maybe a technical thing. I think one of the, um, oh, sorry, forget that. 
So we answered this. Myself and Georgia went through this and we uh, we answered it. So maybe Georgia, from your point of view, and we're kind of looking back now to when we first started working together and, and what the key answers to these questions were. So maybe Georgia, do you want to explain the answers to the questions that we posed? Yeah. Um, so the way I play, um, I'm pretty physical on court um, and I'm very, very passionate. Um, yeah, they're the two things I like to play a fast paced game and uh, use my strength, my fitness to try and take it to my opponent. Um, yeah, why do I like squash? I like it because it's physical um, and on the court, it's just you. You're the one that is in control of whether you win or lose. Um, and there are always ways to improve. That's something that like, I've, I'm definitely learning more and more is that there's there's no stopping on on the learning. Um, like if you look at the top players like Shabagi and Farag and how the way they talk about the way they're training, um, I find it really interesting and inspiring and that they're still working on tiny little things. Um, what they want to achieve, uh, want to be world number one and get a Commonwealth Games medal for Scotland. Um, how do I want to go about doing it? Don't really mind, <laughs> um, but I'd like to work work hard. Um, yeah, push myself physically and mentally in training and work with support staff and everyone who's around me to make the most of my strengths and um, improve my weaknesses as much as possible. Um, my strengths are my speeds, my strength, my passion. Um, yeah, I can dig in when the pain when the pain gets tough, and um, yeah, certainly that was. Um, a big thing when I was younger, I managed to get me through a lot of matches. Um, my weaknesses, the mental side of the game, executing a game plan and keeping control of everything. So whether that be movement, mental side of things, my shot selection, and especially doing that under pressure. Um, where I win matches, I would say is like um, applying pressure. So um, putting in really good length and stepping up the court and being really physical and attacking and taking my counter attacking opportunities well. So getting onto the ball if there's a loose one in the front and then going in and doing something with it. Um, losing matches is normally because I lose my focus. I get distracted by either my own performance, my opponent, the referee, or um, even the crowd sometimes. And then I just completely switch off from what I'm meant to be doing. Um, I stop playing good squash and it just all kind of goes down the drain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and kind of these are things that we recognised and we discussed pretty early on mm -hmm. in the way that we uh, in, in deciding what approach we're going to take because you all know there's so many different ways that you can coach a player. Um, you want to tailor it and the, the role of a good coach is to be adaptable to the player that's in front of them. So rather than me as the coach saying, I coach like this, you need to fit in with that. There's lots of really key information within just answering these questions that can help me as a coach figure out what's the best way to go about helping Georgia. Um, and just, just simple things like making sure that we make sessions physical so she's not getting bored, she likes that. We want to try and make sure that um, that's a quick win for me as a coach if I'm making things physical for her. Um, but also the counter to that is that if she likes be things being physical, then it's probably going to mean that there's not much attention to detail, that she's she's not used to that kind of slower paced attention to detail technical work. Um, but I'll go into some of this stuff later on. Um, I but, also I just add something quickly. Um, yeah. that on the how do they win matches, I think that's a really big thing because when I was younger, I didn't really know. Um, and I think the job of the coach can be to like l make you realize and help you realize what that is and then you can really delve into that a lot further because certainly when I was younger when I was 15 16 I just kind of stepped on court I didn't know how I was going to win whereas now I've got a bit more of a clearer view of what my strengths are and how I can implement them yeah absolutely so it, it's a great process to go through and this really helps you to come up with the way that you are going to approach help uh, support and a player so from this information, I wanted to figure out how that information could help me to help Georgia. And I just came up with a few more questions and a few more, not necessarily questions, but things to really be clear on for myself. And that was, what's going to be the, the best approach to take with this player? What does she like and what does she dislike doing? 
what type of player does she want to become? What gets her excited and motivated? What's going to make the biggest difference in her game? What should we work on first? And then what should we work, when should we work on the other things? Because we all know with squash that there's a million and one things that you could be working on. Uh, but it's really important that you uh, select in the things that are going to make a big difference. And, and maybe that'll, that longer term thinking enables us to say, well, I'll do this aspect of improvement now and then maybe in six months time we can have a look at something else so what we just wanted to do was take you through this um what we what we decided with georgia and the way that i worked with georgia um, in each one of these areas so in terms of the best approach to take uh it was it became really clear that george is a very goal orientated person so we made sure that all of the training was focused and she was always working towards something in terms of kind of creating buy-in and getting her to be as motivated as possible that was what she needed and we had to make sure that everything was really goal driven like we were training for a certain event or we were training to achieve a result against a certain player we were always working towards something there's players out there that just want to get better in the squash and they dive into the technical stuff but i would say that you would agree georgia that that isn't that isn't really you you need to have something that you're looking to achieve right yeah absolutely and from day one like it was i made sure i sat down with you and was like kid these are my goals for this season this is what I want to get to, and I'll, I'll always refer back to them um, like week by week, month by month, I guess. Yeah, that's it. And that becomes a really quick win for me as a coach because I can just, if I if she does a terrible session, then I can just slip in the, I'm not really sure that that session is going to help you to achieve this goal, whatever it is, and then that's, she comes back with a bit more fresh enthusiasm for next time or if we're really looking to make a, a key change that we think will make a big difference to her, if I keep on dangling that carrot of what it is that she is looking to achieve, then that helps the process massively for, to get her focused when we are training and understanding why we're doing what we're doing. So that just little information like that makes a massive difference to uh, to really keep things on track. If we move on to the what does she like and what does she dislike working on? So just from that information that we got, we know that she likes working really hard and we can use that to her advantage. Um, she wants to be seen to be taking things seriously. But like I said, the flip side to that is that she lacks a little bit of attention to detail. The technical side of things doesn't excite her that much. Um, so right from the beginning, we had to my challenge as a coach was how can I make things really high intensity, really physical, get her working, but also keep the quality and the attention to detail of the things that we were trying to achieve. It would have been really easy for me to just put her through a load of pressure sessions, but she probably wouldn't have got any better at squash and her, her results wouldn't have improved by doing that. So there was some restraints in there for me as a coach because I knew I needed to do, do a few things to keep Georgia interested but then I also had the other side of things that I really needed to work on and that was especially um, when it when we talked about the mental side of things like we really wanted to make an improvement in that area um, so how could we be working on mental things as well as making her work really hard and, and making her putting her under pressure physically as well what do you do you, how do you think it would have went if we took a different approach, Georgia, and really focused on maybe more slower technical stuff at that moment in time for you? I would have been out. <laughs> um, I, 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 at that time, I definitely couldn't, I didn't have the concentration and the focus to be able to um, do that kind of stuff. Um, I would have just got really bored, I think, which, which is interesting, like hearing you chat about it now, like if you look about at the season that we're in right now, Actually, I'm doing like five hours a week of just technical stuff, solo against the wall, like racket stuff, which two or three years ago I would never have done or been able to do. Um, so that's definitely been a big journey. Yeah, that's it. And it's the, like that, this technical stuff that you're working on now was a weakness for you three years ago. Mm -hmm. 
but we've only managed to get you to this point. It's through all of the stuff that we've done up until now that's got you to this point though, you can actually start to touch on it and start to work on it um, with, with, a, with a different approach. We would, a lot of coaches would have probably started working on that right from the very start because everyone knows how important the technical side of the game is. So they would have gone straight to that. And as you say, you'd have, you'd have been out and that would have been it. Um, complete waste of, uh, of a great opportunity. If we move on to the uh, what type of player does she want to become? Like One of the great attributes of Georgia is that she doesn't hide away from her goals. A lot of people would, there's a lot of people out there that I'm sure would like to be world number one, but they're not confident enough to say it. Uh, and those people definitely aren't going to achieve it. Um, you've got to be, you got to hold yourself accountable to the things that you want to achieve uh, if you're going to, if you can, as a coach and as, as a player, uh, but definitely as a player. And she's been very upfront and very honest about the fact that she wants to be successful in the game. Um, one thing that was really apparent is that she didn't really have a plan for how that was going to happen. She just knew she wanted to achieve it, which is great from a coach's point of view but it kind of left a few things that were really gonna that i knew were going to be difficult because there was no plan and she didn't care how she did it she just wanted to do it so that's kind of her passion kicking in there rather than actually having a a trajectory a logical approach to how am i going to step by step achieve something that's quite far away from me right now um but um that's that's kind of what we've introduced slowly but surely um, but by me having that information, I could really, really push. I knew I could push her and she would be able to take it. Um, you were you were pretty open to being uh, to being worked hard and, and pushed to become the best you could be right from the start, weren't you, Georgia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think like what you were saying about the goal thing, like that's something that's still um, like today you'll, if I have a bad session, it'll still be, well, you're not going to get to world number one if you're training like that. And actually, it's a big kick up the backside. And then I'm like, no, actually, it's not. Um, yeah, it's all, yeah, I've always been pretty driven by that, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, understanding your player's drive is a, key, is, uh, is a really useful uh, and important tool to have in your tool belt when you're trying to coach someone. Um, trying to understand what gets her excited and motivated as a squash player i kind of re regurgitate an information here but it just shows how important it is like having her goals and looking to achieve them those goals and then set new goals straight away um she isn't really one for kind of lingering on success it's always right i've just won the british championships what we're going to do next and uh, and seeing that inner drive that she has we, is is something that we I need to be aware of and recognize and and go with that. Like George is very fast paced, so therefore I need to be fast paced with her until I until there comes a time that I purposefully slow her down. If we were working in completely different ways all of the time, then that would get great in for both of us and and really put a strain on the coach athlete relationship. Um, so because I know how goal orientated she is, um, it's really important to get the balance right between challenging her for new goals, but making sure that they're achievable as well. So if we could easily focus on just being world number one, but it's gonna be such a long journey to get to that stage that the motivation is gonna be up and down like a yo-yo. So we need to put the, the little goals in that are gonna get her excited and motivated. Um, what, what's your goal right now, Georgia? Uh, get through lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think at the moment, I'm really focusing on the technical side of things and trying to um, become more um, yeah, consistent technically and physically I'm really working on my movement my ability to sustain harder um, movements for a longer period of time I think I'm looking ahead to next season already and I'm thinking okay like I want to be looking at trying to get into top 70 and get some bigger wins and top 50 players but obviously not knowing where the tour is going right now I'm more trying to focus on that technical stuff because it's um, easier to see achievements when there's not much match play going on yeah and I think that one thing to really point out is 
It's so easy. I didn't pre-prep Georgia for that question. I just bring it on her and she can answer the question like that. And that is because we are constantly going back and talking and assessing what she's working towards, why she's working towards it, and what it means for a squash in the future. Um, if I ask most players that we work with kind of in the in the pathway or historically most a lot of players that I've seen in different roles that I've had, you ask them what their goals are and what they're working on at the moment, they haven't got a clue. And you can just tell that that's going to be a, something that really, really limits their progress and slows down how much uh, how much they're achieving in the game. And it's going to really affect their motivation if they're just turning up to, to squash sessions and they don't really know why or what they're trying to get out of it, then that's a real alarm bell from my point of view. Um, can you think back, Georgia, to what when we first started working together, what what was what was the thing that got you motivated back then? Um, I would say I always had, I probably had about three competitions every year that I targeted as like goal events, A events. Um, and those would be the ones that I would just work towards. I definitely didn't have the capability as much to work on technical things because it just didn't motivate me. Um, whereas now that really does, but it was like, um, British champs, British Open and then senior nationals pretty much every year in my three big events that I was trying to work towards. And I would have that from the May. So I'm working from pre-season onwards. Yeah, that was it. And I just used those, that information to my advantage, whatever we were working towards and whatever I wanted to work on. It would just be, right, we're doing this because this is going to help you win the British or we're going to do this because this will help you get to the do well in the British Junior Open. And that was just that constant conversation and reminder to her about what we were working on and why um, was valuable. If we move it on to what's going to make the biggest difference to her game. Um, so this is where we go back to my at slide um, and the real difficulty as as a coach um, I feel like a lot of coaches coach what they feel confident coaching and they focus a lot on one area um, as opposed to challenging themselves broadening their knowledge and doing what the player really needs um, it's I I've gone through spells of it and you really get challenged as a coach. And that's one of the things that I really love about it. Um, but obviously not everyone's the same and everyone there's, I do a lot of work to try and broaden my knowledge base and the experience that I've had helps a lot with that. But I would say it's important for coaches not to be worried about not knowing everything about something. Like there's a lot of the psychology stuff that we do now that, there's just completely over my head and there's, we, that's why we get experts in, but I still tackle it and I still approach it and, and try and help wherever I can um, because I know it's important. And my job there as a coach becomes not a provider of knowledge, but a questioner who can really help a player understand what's going to help in that situation. Um, so when we come to answering a question like what's going to make the biggest difference to her to her game it can be around what's actually going to make a biggest difference not what do I feel confident helping this person work or what do I feel confident teaching so for Georgia back in the day we decided it was about becoming more consistent um, and trying to think about the things that could help with that was her shot quality her mental control her training performance which certainly wasn't wasn't great at the time and her general squash so those were the by for her to become more consistent the reason why we came to that was because she could beat some amazing players and like beat anyone on her day especially from a junior point of view but she could sometimes lose to anyone as well and would the, the consistency of her performance was so up and down that there wasn't really too much of a need to try and make her best game better but what we really wanted to do was make her worst game a lot lot better so that there was less inconsistency and it was less of a roller coaster um every time she went on the on the squash cart so in order to do that, we focused in on shot quality, mental control, and then her training performance and her general squash. 
Um, and I think one of the key things to, to be aware of is that most people would probably go straight to what's going to make the difference or well, open racket face or taking the ball earlier or something very specific and technical. I think one of the beauties about this is that you can be quite broad with it. And this quite a general thing to become more consistent, but there's lots of things that you can work on to help a player to become more consistent. And, uh, and yeah, I think you don't need to go super technical or super detailed when you're trying to make um, decisions around this sort of stuff. Uh, can you think back, Georgia, and like you said, that you agreed with all of this stuff, what, do you, what did becoming more consistent mean to you back then? Um, I think you're right in that um, I could lose matches and win matches, beat lots of people, lose to pretty much anyone, have ridiculously tight matches with someone who I should be able to beat 3-0. So I think it was that being able to... Um, the, the thing that you said about making my worst game better, that's been a really big thing from the start. Um, and actually, like I remember from the start, Paul would... Um, he wrote this... Uh, review of kind of my squash and it was kind of basically saying in general that like, my squash wasn't that good but my movement and my physicality was good so it was trying to become a better squash player and I think the training performance thing is really interesting because I was so I got so frustrated and so annoyed in training sessions maybe 25% of the time would be worthwhile the rest of the time was just pointless so it was figuring out a way to make my training sessions um yeah more consistent as well and mainly mentally more consistent in general yeah that's it so with an with a kind of big goal of becoming more consistent for you as a complete squash player we could then go into the detail and what we decided was from the the big the with the aim that you were going to become more consistent what really needed to make the big what really was going to help you to make a massive difference and what we should work on first was going to be your mentality and you developing a bit of self-awareness around what you were doing on a court and what made you lose the plot, what made you so mental, as we put at the beginning, uh, whether that was in matches, in training, whatever. Um, so in order for her to become more consistent, we needed her to be able to improve lots of different areas, mostly around control. So in helping her to control her emotions and training and in competition was going to be a massive first step to helping her to become more consistent. So we've gone from a quite generic thing with saying that we want to be cons more consistent to then looking at the, right, how are we now going to become more consistent and then diving down a little bit deeper. So we're using that magnifying glass to go, right, we want consistency. Now we want to improve the mental performance. And, and within the mental performance, the first thing that we need to do to improve that is self-awareness. So we're, we're digging down deeper and deeper, which is a process that we go through. And then... The long term, so using the binoculars now, we've got right now what we wanted to be working on is the mentality uh, really specifically um, from a training point of view. And then as we train, we're going to always want to be trying to improve the general squash side of things because that's going to help her a lot. Um, but there's also some things that were we knew were really important and have had a big difference. But where it wasn't the right time to work on them or the mental stuff was more important right now because if we got the mental stuff right then some of those other things might fall into place um so the things that we kind of wanted to just put a pin in and save for later were the technical stuff and we're kind of only really scratching the surface with the technical stuff like three years later now so the, all of the things that we work that we're working on now from a technical point of view they were apparent and they were causing her a lot of issues three years ago but there was just absolutely no way like like georgia said that we could possibly even think about working on them it would have just went completely pear shaped um the mentality stuff is something that is always going to be 
an issue for George, well, not necessarily an issue, but an area that Georgia needs to pay close attention to. Like, it's going to, the mentality stuff will probably make or break Georgia as a squash player. And so it's always needs to be something that we remember and we're working on. Uh, the movement stuff, like we talked about, I don't know if anyone knows Georgia or has seen her play, but three years ago it was all about diving around and kind of very unorthodox, but it was effective from a junior point of view. But while it was kind of her trademark thing back then, it certainly wasn't going to help her to become world number one. And someone like a Paul Collar is a really good example of that, that as he's become a better squash player and risen up the ranks, you're seeing less and less of him diving around the squash cart. Um, and part of that was a tactical thing as well. Her decision making when she was on there wasn't great, which was causing her to, to have to use her physicality to get out of trouble. Um, as opposed to using it as, a, as an advantage. But if we just put it into context, if I started talking to you three years ago about diving around Georgia and trying to improve your movement to stop yourself from diving, what would you have said? Mm, probably something like, well, I win the rally or like, oh, I don't know, something defensive, backing myself up. Yeah, like that was your USP as a squash player back then, wasn't it? You were yeah. the girl that dived about the car and you liked that about yourself. Yeah, I also think, um, interestingly, you were saying about decision making, like that movement side of thing came into the mentality. Because as we all know, like your the mentality that you've got on court affects your decision making. So it all kind of came back to that one thing. Um, yeah. So it took, it probably took me to when we got to the stage where the mental side of things was improving for me to actually stop diving as much yeah and that's why when we this is why you need to go through this process and you can reverse engineer it the way that whatever way you want but as we looked in more and more detail about George's game and what was important and what was working a lot of it came back to the mentality piece like the tactical decision making stuff was because mentally she was all over the shop and she was just doing whatever shot came into her mind just before she was about to hit the ball movement she was just flinging around she didn't have she wasn't in control of her emotions she just wanted to get the ball back and she would dive about and do whatever it took to stay in the rally without any strategy or thought behind it and the same with shot quality she was so irate and emotional when she's on there that there was absolutely no way that she could was thinking about anything technical or implementing any technical technical skills to be able to hit with a good high quality so everything that we looked at well why is that an issue why is that an issue why is that an issue well it's mental everything comes back to being mental so we spent a bit of time with that and that's why we came to the thing that we need to really make sure that we get what's the first thing to work on is make an improvement in the mental side of the game any questions on that before i move on i guess this is a good time to maybe take a little question break alan there's nothing like come in when you've been talking but just give people a couple mm -hmm. minutes they might want to Throw some stuff in just now. Don't think so. Or the other yeah. option is that everyone's left and we're talking to ourselves. <laughs> uh, here, here's a few coming in. So, so when you were talking about like reverse engineering like where would you start with that process someone's asking um i usually start from all of the things that i think are weaknesses or, or issues within a player's game so i write them all down look through I, obviously like i said i watch them back in a match situation and then write key things that i think are causing issues with for the player and then I just try and link them all together and see if there's anything that the thing that stands out the most uh, as I'm doing that. Um, obviously, I've had quite a lot of experience doing it, so it's quite a short process. But as if you're just starting off with this process or if uh, if you're a young coach who's getting started, then really just trying to write it down and and see, well, and always asking why. Well, 
they aren't hitting their targets when they're playing a match well why is that is it a technical thing is it a movement thing like what is it that's causing a problem what is it that's causing a problem and just keep on going through that until you get to the end and and like i said with georgia every time i asked why eventually it came to mental so why is is a shot quality not where it needs to be oh well it's this and why is that because of that and why is that because of mental what what's wrong with her movement well she does this and why is that because of this why is that because of this and why is that mental so that like it always eventually if you keep on asking why enough then you get to the point that it'll give you what the real reason for uh, for the problem being that's quite good so that leads quite nicely on to the next question that came in um around like the mental side and i guess this also links to some potential parents of players that are maybe involved in the chat so how do you work on the mental side of a player's game uh, what's what's the process involved in that or is that a tricky <laughs> one as well to answer yeah really difficultly um but i think that like i said the self-awareness piece was that was the important bit and it takes a long time i think the mental side of it is like i said with georgia like we're never gonna have ticked that box to say right we're done with that um i would say that the player has got to be open to it to begin with so i'll talk you through what we did to try and create that buy-in with georgia but there was there's certain aspects of it that you're never gonna be able to work on until like you're not going to be able to achieve anything unless the player is with you on that and unless they really understand why you're looking to make that change and what that what impact that change is going to bring uh so you first of all need to get the player on the on the right page with you and suddenly once you get that it just becomes so much easier I'm not saying it becomes easy, but it becomes a lot easier. So that you can work through things and figure out what works and what doesn't work and getting feedback from the from the player. Um, but yeah, there's lots. I'll actually, I'm answering that question in a couple of slides time so I can maybe just uh, just pause on that question and I'll just talk around it without giving everything away. That's all right. Really? Cool. Is there any, anything else? Or? Yeah, well, what, one more one, I guess, which would be mm -hmm. interesting and probably a difficult answer again, but around time scales. Um, so did yeah. you always have like a time scale in place to achieve every main objective or goal? Um, I guess it, it changes with each individual player and the time scale will vary, but how did you approach time scales? Yeah, I mean, we didn't really put time scales on anything. Like it's the, the journey of a squash player is huge and you're never gonna get 10 out of 10 in every aspect of your game like georgia said even ali farag and mohammed ostrabagi are still working on things to improve their game um but what we did is we put in review times and um so we gave ourselves a timeline as to when we were gonna hope that some impact and some some changes had been made and then that's when we were going to look back and see, was this working? Are we making progress? Is there anything that we need to do differently? Or can we say that this is, is this is now in a good place and we can move on to the next thing? So we did everything in phases and it usually works around um, like key moments. So we would have like mini assessments every single match that Georgia played. So getting feedback and review and reflection of every single match that you played could give us an indication of how things were going and, and were we making progress. Um, always, with, But the key times that we were having proper reviews would be after, after the key events that we'd identified. So after those goals and the moment of goals, um, it was quite easy because George's goals were very results driven uh, and they had key competitions with them. Um, so after the British Championships, we would sit down and say, right, how are we getting on? How did that go? Um, where are we at in terms of making some progress in this area? Then we would do exactly the same um, at the British Open. So there wasn't like a date that we said, well, this is going to be as good as it can get by this date. It was just a constant reviewing um, and hoping that we... I wouldn't necessarily say hope is the right idea. Like well, you need to have confidence in what you're doing and your abilities as a coach. So say, give yourself a, 
a timeline to say, I think I can make an impact in this length of time. So I said, if we just use the example of the, the technical stuff that we're working on now with Georgia, like we sat down and had a conversation about the technical side of the game and what we would need to do to, to make some improvements and why. And then we said, this is going to take a long time. So all the cards were on the table. And so I, say, I said to Georgia, look, this isn't a quick fix that so you need to give me. So we did, we just did a little tweak of your grip, Georgia, didn't we? Back in January. And yeah. I said, you need... graffiti on the grip. You what? Lots of graffiti on the grip. Yeah, that's it. But I said to her, I need 12 weeks where you don't care about your squash to be able to help you with your grip. And then, so she had to agree that that was the right time to do it because she was willing to give me 12 weeks to be able to not get distracted by results and everything else that was going on. Um, so, but I guess that that 12 weeks just kind of comes from experience and understanding how long it takes for people to, to get to grips with these things. I also think uh, with the uh, results-based goal stuff, I remember sitting down at the start of one season I said I wanted to win the British champs, the British Open and the European champs. And you said, when I set those goals, you said, just remember that you could make none of these goals and it would still be a successful season. Um, and I think that was really helpful to hear because I knew that like those are my targets, but actually I didn't meet all of them that year. And I still felt like I had a really successful year just by even setting them and setting those goals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. So I think timelines are good, um, but as long as there's context around it as to what what success look like looks like within those timelines. So all we usually try and do is make some positive progress in the areas as opposed to actually achieving something specific and ticking it off. I'm not sure if that answers the question, or Alan, but hopefully it gave an indication. Time skills are difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think um, that's that's all the main ones. So feel free to. to okay, on. nice one. Um, so for the next little section, I just wanted to kind of highlight how difficult it is. So if we look, if we go back to the background of the picture that I drew at the beginning, and the issue with squash and with squash coaching, uh, and that. For a squash player, there's so many important factors that go into becoming a top squash player. It's so difficult to know where to start. It's so difficult to know which one is the is the key thing that needs to be worked on at this very moment. And so, like obviously, when we're talking about com trying to develop the complete squash player, like what goes into success as a as a as a player is the mental side of the game is really important and obviously that's something specific to Georgia but there's also the technical side of things as well which every coach knows are really important um, there's the tactical side of it which is crucial uh, the physical side of things is is something that coaches even if you're not necessarily going to take them on their full journey from a physical point of view um, you still need to get them get them going in the right way and be able to have some input into the physical side of the game and how they're going to develop. And then also the lifestyle is a big side of it that I think perhaps gets missed by a lot of uh, a lot of coaches and a lot of players, like the impact on the lifestyle stuff that we had to take into consideration. We had to really focus a lot of time and effort on too. If, we, if I just think about Georgia over this period that she's gone through, at the beginning, it was when can we do sessions because she's relying on her parents to drop her off uh, to get up to Orium. She's got school. She's going through her exams. There were so many things to take into consideration. And then she went on to college. Then she passed a driving test. So that changed things again. And... Then she's now gone to university and she's she was living by herself, of living out of home for the first time. So there's all those sort of things. There's all the things that go with university. And like I would probably say, Georgie, you can you can add in here that a lot of a lot of the conversations that we have and a lot of the 
challenges that we face come from a lifestyle point of view, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I would agree. Mm-hmm. I think, so, especially like if you take my first year of uni, it was and my first and my year at college. Th- those two years were kind of chaos. Like I was all over the place mentally. I didn't know like what I wanted to have felt about squash. It was I was so up and down, um, and. And now kind of this year I've settled into that and understand kind of what it looks like to manage my time. But it took a lot of time to realise what that was going to look like. Yeah, that's it. So I think in terms of developing the complete squash player, it's important that you recognise that these five areas are crucial to the success of your coach-athlete relationship and the success for the player that you're working with. So sometimes you ramp them up and sometimes you the amount of time that you spend on them and sometimes you can just leave them simmering in the background but there's you need to be able to have some positive impact in all of these areas because players are going to go through issues in their career that that require you to support them in all of these so if you you can't just become a really good technical coach and help a player achieve what they want to achieve to a high level like and if this is where kind of my first week's uh, webinar on the, like developing yourself as a coach comes in, a lot of coaches really focus in on areas that they like or they're good at. Um, but if you are going to be a really successful coach, then you need to have some skills in all five of these areas that will help you to support a player in in this way and in these ways. So the next bit is uh, is really like this. There's lots of balls up in the air, and there's lots of different things going on. They're all overlapping. The it's real chaos um, when you are trying to help a squash player, and I'm sure it's the same in all sports. But squash players certainly bring their fair share of chaos. Um, so with all of this stuff, it's really important that you don't get distracted. So every time, if you have kind of mini reviews, every match that a player plays, I can remember when it, since I've been working with Georgia, it's one match she plays and she loses it mentally. So right, mentally, we need to sort this out. And then she'll go on and play the next match and she'll come off and say, oh, my squash was terrible. I'm so, I can't hit a straight drive. So the temptation there is that you need to go and start working technically to improve that. Then the next match she goes and plays and she was felt really unfit. She couldn't keep going. After two matches, she was knackered. So like, right, okay, well, we better do some physical work then, hadn't we? And then before you know it, if you get distracted through every bit of information that the game gives back to you, then you're going to make zero progress in any area and just kind of dip your toe into all of them. So the key for you in terms of your developing the player is to focus in on what's important. Stay focused. You've identified an area for a reason. So we identified that mental, the mental side of the game was the most important thing. And if she improved in that area, then a lot of other areas would improve with it. So that's what our key was. It's not to say that we don't take pay any attention to the other side of things, but we want to stay focused on the mental side of the game is what we're working towards and what we've agreed that we're going to really try and make a positive impact on and avoid getting distracted by all of the other things that that come into play. So just to kind of highlight that my approach and the way that the way that we've done things here. So just kind of another another image for you. Um, but I would di- this is to kind of highlight our day-to-day coaching approach. So we have the five aspects, the technical, tactical, physical, mental, and lifestyle. And they're kind of in the background. So you're always working towards being better in those areas. And you kind of just do that by hitting a ball, by playing matches, by doing your general gym work that everyone does. Like It's just your general week, however you structure it. You should have aspects of all five of those in them. So you are working on them, you're developing them, you're challenging yourself and testing yourself out week in, week out, day in, day out in these five areas. But the real interest, 
the, the thing that you should really be interested in and focused on is whatever it is that you've decided. So this image has got the, the player and the coach there really focused in on whatever it is that they've agreed is going to be the thing. So for me and Georgia, that would have been mental. We would have had a separate mental block as well as the, the one that's in the five key areas. But we would have had mental self-awareness as that's the thing that we're really focused on in every session. So you're always getting better in the background with all the key aspects to the game of squash to help you to become a better squash player. But what we're really, really interested in and what we're act proactively trying to improve is whatever the key focus area is. Um, so we're not avoiding, because for some coaches and for some situations that I've been in, and I've been there in the past myself when I was younger, like one minute you'd pick up the technical box and say, right, this is it. I need to focus on some technical stuff. And then next week it's like, right, let's do a physical session. Now you jump in between them and you're not actually making any progress in any area. So a real lesson that I've learned over the years is once you figure out what the key thing is, you stick with it until you feel like you've made enough progress that you can move on to something else and that you've seen something work really well. So if we bring that into a specific approach from the mental side of things, I decided to illustrate this through a, a roller coaster because that's how I would describe working with Georgia. Um, so this roller coaster kind of takes you through step by step in the way that we have or the way that we did try and work on improving her um, mentality her mental side of the game and more importantly her self-awareness so georgia do you just want to talk us through this and take come at it from your point of view yeah um so straight away i think for both of us it was clear that the mental side of the game was an issue both um in training and in matches and three years on we're still not there and i don't think we ever will be completely there like um Certainly in training, it's completely, it's got a lot better. And um, matches, it's still pretty up and down. Um, but at the start, it was like, okay, this is what we're going to work work on. And um, we kind of, yeah, chatted about what was wrong with it. Um, so we looked at videos, painfully watched matches back, I guess, and um, chatted things through. Um, I think a big thing about that was, Paul, you got to know me. Um, you got to know what it was I liked about squash, the reasons I played it. Um, and yeah, and then we worked really hard. Um, I think it was, I was pretty hot and cold. So sometimes I'd be really keen, some days I really wouldn't. And um, uh, I think it was pretty tough for you, Paul, to, um, yeah, I was pretty up and down with it all. Um, but in sessions, it'd be really constantly thinking about what am I thinking about? Am I thinking positively? Am I thinking about the squash side of things? Um, one of Paul's things was always, it's actually, it's really easy. It's not, it's not complex. And I find this really frustrating for ages until I realised what he meant. Um, so, yeah, so we did lots of reviewing every session. Um, there was lots of tough conversations, I think, as that kind of says at the end. Um, and then it was looking at what it was then like under pressure as we worked on it. Um, and then come down off of that we would have a chat about what went on and this is what I've said about tough conversations it was definitely something that um, we had to do I think um, but also not only that there was also the positive side of things so when it was when it was done well we would recognise that and we would we would see that we would watch videos of that and um, be able to compare and write down what it was that um, I was thinking about in, in that space and in that time how I felt before how I felt after um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well put. And it was it was definitely like a roller coaster. And I think just what what this slide is here for is just to represent like what we were trying to achieve and then the way that we went about it. So at the beginning, it was about getting buy in from Georgia so that she recognised and understood why this was going to make a difference. Um, we'd had a discussion and we'd already agreed it. But I needed to keep on making sure that she was aware of it, um, and and all of the review sessions that we did, we I made her, or I asked her to start a journal, and just so she could really focus in on what was going on on a day to day basis. And then we we did use a lot of video feedback, which 
yeah, I think you kind of like and don't like Georgia, don't you? Um, yeah. Like you, but you, the key was that you found it useful and it resonated with you. So we kept on doing it. And then we put in some interventions and strategies. And this is where the tough approach came in. So I think a lot of coaches have got a style that they like. Some are dictators, some are questioners, and and that's okay. But like I've just already said, the being adaptable as a coach is, is the important thing for me. And I needed to say to myself that in order for this to happen, I need to be tough and I need to make sure that I'm on Georgia the whole time. And as soon as I see these things slipping, then I need to be there making sure that I make her aware of it and give her the opportunity to turn it around. Because if I just... We've got a question, Paul. Yeah. Could you give us an example of a tough conversation? Well, I mean, I would say that the tough conversation is kicking you off the car in the middle of a training session when you're not focusing on your mental stuff at all, when you're losing the plot and you're smashing the rackets against the wall. I wouldn't usually do that for every player. It's actually something that I like to see players doing because it shows they mean something, especially in training. But for Georgia, when in during this situation, when we are working on trying to be more controlled and, and staying emotionally aware and a, for being clear on what you're trying to achieve mentally during the session when you lose that like I had to be there I, I had to be tough and I had to kick her off and say no you you're not doing this session and then I would make her wait till the end of the session and we would talk about it and see what was going on and how she could have approached it differently and there's plenty of times that you were in tears and and whatnot but that was the way that I was going to constantly keep on pushing the message that you needed to recognize what was going on on court during these moments and try and do something about it. It wasn't acceptable when you were working on trying to be better mentally to let yourself do that. I think also, like, another thing, sorry, and um, just to add is that um, we also recognize there was stuff going on outside of the squash court. So you were making sure you were keeping on me at making sure I was focusing on that as well. And you were checking in on me on that side of things as well. So knowing that um, that was part of the, like, getting to know me as a person. So it wasn't just the squash that was an issue. There was further stuff going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so th I think that that bit in the interventions and strategies, but it's like, what am I going to do as a coach? In some situations, I would just completely leave the player to their own devices and help let them figure it out for themselves. But if we have an, a strategy for the player, then we should have a coaching strategy about how you're going to work with that player through it. Um, so lots of feedback, making sure that I gave her the space to call it herself as well. And she would say, actually, mentally, I'm not in this at all. I need a break. And she would just walk off in the middle of a session to gather herself back and then come back in. And then we constantly kept on trying to test it under pressure and in real life scenarios to see how it was working. And then that review section was uh, understanding how we were going to review it. So it was only applicable in high pressure matches and, and in matches that she was playing. So that's when we would review it after every match that she played, we would then just have a quick conversation around, was it good, was it bad? And challenging her on it. I think for a lot of juniors, they would just say, oh, it was rubbish. And that would be the end of the conversation. But I had to really coax out of her what was good, what was bad, what she could have done better and, and really make her face it, um, which is another example of a tough conversation. Um, it doesn't, a tough conversation doesn't always have to be the coach shouting at the person and making them cry. Um, although that did happen, it's the other side of things as well. And it's just the tough part of it is having the conversation and making sure that the conversation takes place when it would be really easy just to be like, oh, well, go away and think about it. And then it never gets, uh, it never gets addressed again. Um, but the positive reinforcement stuff and then using the video examples in as part of the review as well to say this is when you did it really well and this is maybe an example of what could have been done better. Um, so hopefully that sheds a little bit of light onto that that side of things and I just put in this slide about kind of the review process that we went through and um, so when we talk about trying to develop the complete squash player we have got cat we've got some real clear ideas about 
the physical aspects, the technical aspects, the tactical, the physical and the the psychological, sorry, and the bit and the lifestyle behavior behaviors and, and key attributes that we're looking to create. And then we assess the players based upon that so they can get a clear idea of uh, of what's going on. If we just go back to this kind of approach, because that's kind of the end of the explanation about what we did as a as a partnership, myself and Georgia. Does anyone have any questions about any of that whole approach? Uh, and anything that they'd want to know a little bit more information about. Got anything coming in, Alan? Um, yeah, so Keith asking around what was the purpose of the journal so did you oh okay so that's referred to in like the different the different stages i guess <clears throat> yeah the journal like journal journaling is something that i think is really important for players and for coaches just so they can keep on track of what they're trying to do um i guess georgie you like you use it as a player do you want to kind of give us the benefits that you feel from a journal in point of view uh, yeah, so I personally feel like it gives me like guidance over what I'm going to do that session, what I'm, what my goal is that week. Um, uh, I I really enjoy reflecting and reviewing, and I think I find that really helpful after events. Um, just an understanding of where I'm at, and I think you can then look back and look forward, and um, yeah, it just gets gets your thoughts out in a bit of paper as well. Um, so when things are hard or whatever it is like I also use journal and during sessions so I would write down stuff if something was going on and then that would just be out my head and I could then try and concentrate on the actual squash yeah and I think um, it just doing something like that where you're writing something down whether it's formally as a journal or what it just helps players to have to answer simple questions more often so they become clearer in their thoughts um, like I said most players, probably don't have a clue what it is that they're working on in their squash. But Georgia has to answer that question for herself every single day. What am I working on today? What is this session for? Did I achieve it just through her journaling? And then that then becomes a real focus area, something that she can remind herself and can spit off really, really quickly and clearly whenever she gets asked it. And that that's massive. Um, to to really help players stay focused on what they're what they're wanting to do and how they're going about being su being successful. Another question um, from Jesse, who I think recently completed the level two, and this potentially came up in some discussion. So, do you ever consider? And George, you might have touched on this actually at the start when you were talking about strengths and weaknesses and things. Do you ever consider do any consideration into like super strengths? So building on what you feel is already strong areas um, to maybe increase or improve your confidence further for maybe Paul or Georgia whoever wants to yeah I'll I'll, I'll I'll take this one and I mean that is pretty much the basis of why we do that at the beginning so that there's there's an even kind of split upon what it is that we're trying to do that you do well and how can we make it as good as possible um, and you kind of always working on making your strengths better well always working on trying to make your weaknesses a bit better too um, obviously what we talked about at the beginning when we talked about the consistency and trying to make Georgia's worst game a little bit better like that was the key for this but um, so there'll be certain times that you'll focus a little bit more on building your strengths into super strengths but uh, I would say that we never forget about your strengths do we Georgia? No I was no so I would say it's uh almost about utilizing them in the best way possible um and I think for a while when I was a lot younger I just relied on my speed and strength um whereas now that's almost like a backup thing that I try and use um and I think it's also reminding that like while all this was going on I was still trying to get stronger I was still trying to get faster we were still doing sessions around increasing the pace and intensity and pushing my T position up it wasn't all about this mental stuff, even though that was the main focus. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that two way approach and like uh, making sure that you don't forget about what the player that you want to become and all of the, the things that you identify is just helping you become that player. Um, and the player that you want to become is a lot, a lot of that is going to be based around your strengths. One maybe final one as well, because I guess this may vary depending the level of athlete you're working with. But as a coach, Paul, like they're looking whether there was like whether you felt maybe you ever worried that the player or in this case Georgia may walk away, um, given that you were maybe delivering sessions that would um, create quite a dif um, difficult environment for Georgia or create um, or a, like she'd go away from that session being so upset that you know because, because of what you were working on any any worry that. Georgia may have decided at one point, you know, just to walk away from squash or um, any thoughts. Georgia was never, ever going to walk away from squash because of me. Um, I think the reason for that and the reason why I can say that so confidently is because she was part of all of the decision making about why we went about doing what we what we did. Well, not necessarily the decision making, but she understood the strategy right from the start. And I utilized the information that she gave me to make decisions about what we were going to do and why we were going to do it. And as soon as Georgia kind of showed any sort of hesitation or like she wasn't 100% clear or she wasn't sold on what we were going to do, then we didn't do it. Everything came from my her giving me an indication that she really wanted to work on this and she understood what it was going to take. Um, would you or would you agree with that, Georgia? Yeah, I think um, just another thing there, like uh, I think that was also about your understanding of me as a person and that I, I'm someone who, when there's a problem, I want to fix it. Um, and I recognise this is a problem and I was so motivated to fix it. And yeah, like I'm not going to lie, there were ups and downs. There were times where I was like finding squash really hard, but that was also because of personal struggles as well alongside it. But I was so motivated to... You know, I've got that goal in my head of where I want to go in my squash. I knew that getting through this and making this better was going to get there. Um, and yeah, it was tough, but it was just definitely worth it. And yeah. Yeah, I think that whole getting to know the person and getting to know the squash player that they want to become makes this makes that so much easier because every time she was on a bit of a low, I could just chuck in the, all right, so we're going to win the British Championships, right? Or this is going to help us to win the British Championships or whatever it was that would motivate her. And then straight away, we would get that instant instant buy-in and, and bit of bit of excitement to, to keep on pushing forwards. Um, without that information, it would have been a, a lot harder. And there probably would have been times that it was too difficult for Georgia to, to try and go through this process and she might have walked away. But by me doing all of that background and doing that information, gaining all of that information about her at the very beginning, it just makes every decision so much easier for me as a coach. So if we, just as a final thing, <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of, that was the process that we went through with Georgia and thanks to Georgia for, for providing her insight into it as well and and you can ask a few more questions at the end if you want but I just wanted to kind of showcase that how this process might work for different in different situations as well so I just wanted to kind of go run quickly run through what I would do if I was trying to help a beginner squash player because um, obviously not everyone's gonna be lucky enough to work with someone like Georgia who's massively motivated and uh, and wanting to be world number one. So how would I use this model um, to help me with with a complete beginner? So the same questions are still there as I use uh, with Georgia and I'm just gonna run through quickly how I would answer them. So in terms of what's the best approach to take, uh, I'd want to be helping the beginner to fall in love with the game of squash and therefore increase the likelihood of them pursuing excellence. That would be the approach that I'd want to take. And the key part of that is falling in love with the game. Uh, what? It, how can I help them to fall in love? And that's the key driver in all the decisions that I make. Um, 
what do they like and dislike working on? So I would try lots of different activities with the beginner to explore what it is that they like, trying to seek a lot of feedback and see uh, see what works for them, see what doesn't, and then giving them more time working on the things that they really like and and uh, cutting short the time of, uh, of what they would do. I see a lot of coaches that are working with beginners that have got a very rigid, like this is what you do for the first three weeks or six weeks or whatever it might be. Um, working with a player and you have to get the grip right and you have to do this and you have to do that uh, because you'll never be a good player if you don't. Whereas my approach would be more around kind of figuring out what they want to do and what they want to, what they like within the game and then trying to do that as much as we possibly can um, to really keep them motivated and and interested in, interested in all the sessions that we're running. Uh, when it comes to the type of player, what type of player do they want to become? Like they're not going to have any idea what type of player they want to become. Um, so the key would be just to make sure it's fun. Um, and hopefully if it's fun and they're inspired by the game and all the different things that you can do within it, then they'll develop some aspirations within the sport that will help them to determine what type of player they want to become in the future. I wouldn't have any expectations of a beginner being able to answer that question right now, but I would definitely want to be helping them to answer that in the future. Um, getting motivated and excited. Uh, and just talking from my experience of working with junior players here, um, but most of them love just playing the game. Uh, we did a we did a bit of a survey around our juniors, so I think it was 50 juniors um, within our junior excellence program in Scotland, and we said to them, "What's the best part of squash?" as one of the questions, and I think 95% of the answers were playing a game. Or what or What's your favourite thing about squash? Um, or what's your favourite activity in squash? Was the actual question, and the answer was match play every time 95 percent match play match play match play match play and then when i look around at a lot of coaching that i see they might get five minutes at the end of an hour and a half session to do a bit of match play and you see them especially the young ones and the new players new to the game that's all they want to do they want to play a match and while it might you don't want it to just be that carrot at the end to keep them interested in what you're doing like that's what's going to help them to fall in love with the game so therefore let them do it and the challenge as a coach becomes how can I facilitate some learning through them doing what they want to do and through them doing what they're going to enjoy. So let them play as much as they can. And can I then create a, a situation where they can still learn a lot from me as a coach while they're playing a game? If we move on to what's going to make the biggest difference to a beginner's game, in my opinion, is getting them hitting as many balls as possible. Uh, and lighten that squash fire inside of them. So they get really enthused about the game. They hit the ball. Like one of the things that most players love about squash is that they can hit the ball really hard. They get to hit it as hard as they can. Um, so I want them to be trying different shots, doing different things and, and avoiding that whole stands in the queue waiting to hit the shot and you hit the ball once every 10 shots. Um, young players and beginners to the game want to want to get that ball in the hand and want to smack it around and run about and if you can facilitate that it's only going to be a good thing um what should we work on first my answer to this one would be whatever they want to do um trying to be led by them as much as you can um remember reminding yourself that you want them to fall in love with the game uh, you want to really get them thinking about what it is that they want to get out of the sport. So being led by them, offering advice throughout to help them to improve and learn, but I'll let them do whatever they want and just make sure that they're falling in love with this great sport. Because we know how good the sport can be, but it's how are they going to understand and learn how good the sport is. And then finally, we have when should we work on all the other things? And like I said, I wouldn't be forcing kids into like get the grip right, learn this shot, do this, do that. Like they'll get there eventually. Um, you should have a plan. Like as a coach, the reason why 
you want to do that right from the beginning is because you know it's important and it absolutely is but like i think we've demonstrated with georgia is it's only gonna work if they're ready for it and if they want it and if they're willing to make that change then it becomes so much easier to do it with them. If they're, if all they're interested in is smacking a ball around and running about, playing the game, and you're fighting that by trying to teach them the right grip, then it's going to become a real battle and the enjoyment's going to be lost within that. Um, so you should, you have all that knowledge, you have all that expertise, you know they need to improve in certain areas of their game and try and figure out and work with them to understand when they're ready and willing to make those changes and up until that point let them have fun let them figure out what they want to do so hopefully that is just a quick fire understanding of how you can use this model with all different players it's not just about how do you produce the next world champion it's what you can follow through with this uh, in whatever you could do it with an adult player that you're working with uh, and every everything in between so that is me done with that. Is any, Alan, is there anything else? That's yeah, there's, a, there's a couple of ones come in. Really interesting, and thanks to thanks to Georgia for sharing some of those those thoughts. Um, one, Paul, that maybe so linking to like club coaches, and it'd be good to get your thoughts from maybe when you were in your previous role before coming to the governing body. So potential like challenges around you know, that period to review or goal set um, when maybe you're just typically working with a player, you know, that you see in a session on a once, you know, a once a week basis, for example, and the majority of time spent, you know, just to try to get them on court and hitting. Mm -hmm. um, any maybe thoughts or maybe points to think about for club coaches that maybe are having challenges around using that period for goal setting, reviewing, working with the players, what you've just covered? Yeah, I think that... I, in my opinion, it falls to the club coach to try and create those opportunities. Like when I was a club coach, I saw it as getting on court and running the sessions. I was doing what individuals were and all that sort of stuff. But I was always also running competitions, encouraging them to go and play in other competitions and, and really opening up the door to all of the different things that they could do. And even if there isn't competitions or they're, they're not in a position that they want to go traveling around to compete, just having like little mini competitions every within your club. So we used to do Saturday morning coaching and it was three weeks of coaching. And then the fourth week was always a mini tournament. So you could then start to have those conversations with the, with the players about, oh, they were way much better this, this month or... Uh, this is you could really do with working on your serve and just trying to consistently reinforce and and get them thinking in the way that I want to get better I want to improve what I'm doing for the next time that I get to compete and um, if you just it doesn't need to be formal all of these all of these things that I've gone through um, you can just do them really off the cuff and it's about having good communication with the people that you're working with so that you're constantly reinforcing messages, providing feedback, and hopefully giving them ideas about what they might want to do next and what they want to, how they might want to improve as a squash player. And if you can motivate them in that way, then they'll keep coming back and they'll, they'll get excited. And then one other one that came in slightly earlier, uh, I'm just cautious of time for those that have yeah. joined us and need to head, so thank, thanks very much. But I don't think there's any more, so maybe one just to finish off around, like coaches, as a coach, do you keep any, when you spoke about like journals, do you keep any sort of corresponding journals that maybe links to the player as well? So when you're working with Georgia, um, so then it becomes a bit of a go-to document or do you leave that ownership in the player? How does, how does that sort of work? Um, I do, I have my own journal uh, and do that every day so that I remember what I've done. Um, generally just write a couple of points on each lesson that I've done or each session that I've done with the players so that I remember what the key point is. Um, because I'm living and breathing it, it's kind of always at the forefront of my mind. So I don't need to worry about that sort of stuff too much. And you can always, if ever I forget about what, what we're on, then I'll just ask the player and hopefully they'll 
have it in the front of their minds as well. Um, but we generally, my favourite question as a club coach was, what do you want to work on today? Every single session, I would always start the session off with, what do you want to work on today? And that would hopefully, because I was doing like, probably like 30, 35 lessons when I was a club coach, all, all with different people once a week. Um, it was very difficult to keep track of like what you were working on. But most of the time, they would come back wanting to either have something that they've worked that we worked on last time that they want to get better at and keep working on, or they'll have something that they've experienced in a match through the week that they come in and say, oh, my serves were terrible this week, so can we ever work on that? And it's a really good, good process to go through to just help the players that you're working with to come bring something to the table rather than just expecting you to have all of the all of the answers um so i do i do keep tracking it we have documents that we use with every single player where we review them come up with some key areas that we're working on and that keeps it, everything clear and what the key things that we're working on i wouldn't necessarily write down the specific approach with every single player but like I said, my experience over the years helps has helped me to kind of just know what to do in those situations. But young coaches out there and new coaches to this, uh, I would definitely recommend writing as much down as you can. Just little key points that will keep you on track with what you're trying to do. Brilliant. Thanks. I think that, that pretty much covers us and I'm aware we've ran a little bit over. So thanks again to both, both you and Georgia for, for sharing that. Um, I think just just for info, guys, we're obviously delivering another one next week, which is focusing on developing a club program, club coaching program. So Kylie Lindsay, our senior performance coach and club development officer, is going to um, going to lead that session, and then she's going to be joined by Lauren Selby, who is one of the directors of coaching at Off the Wall Squash. So it'd be quite interesting for those of you maybe in club positions or work to support a club program. So feel free to register for that. Um, we'll upload this again to the YouTube channel, so if you want to flip back through it and um, to hear some of those thoughts again. Um, and likewise, send in any feedback. It's always helpful to know. I know some people have been in touch, but it just helps us to steer these. Hopefully they're helpful while we're still in this lockdown period. Um, and then for those of you that are linked in Scotland, we've set up like a coaching forum for licensed coaches that just to try and create more discussion and grow a, a little bit of a stronger coaching network in Scotland. So it's places that maybe some of these conversations could happen between coaches, so feel free to to get in touch if you'd like to be part of that but otherwise hope you're all staying safe and we'll hopefully join some of you next week thanks very much thanks very much guys thanks paul cheers <laughs>